What's going on guys? My name is Brandon and I make video games and YouTube videos about making video games and so does my friend here, Hugo, or much better known as Code Monkey. Thank you so much for appearing on the podcast and appearing on the episode. I'm really, really excited to have you here. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for having me. This should be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it should. All right. So for people who are listening who do not know who you are and don't know what you do, uh, do you just want to tell us a little bit about, about you and what you do and just a little bit about why I'm so excited to be talking to you right now. <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, so for me, I'm a indie game dev and YouTube content creator. So I've been making games on Steam for about uh, 10 years now, using Unity for the same amount of time. And I started my YouTube channel about five years ago where I do pretty much anything related to Unity. So tutorials, asset reviews, random highlights, random things, pretty much anything related to Unity or game dev. That's pretty much what I do. Awesome. Uh, and I'm curious because you're like the go-to guy for Unity, right? Like if anyone wants to learn Unity, they go to Code Monkey these days, right? Um, so <laughs> you're you're kind of at this stage where I think a lot of people when they're starting out, um, they want to be at in terms of your skill level, right? So can you just give me a little bit of a history in terms of how you got started in your game dev journey and how you learned everything that you know? Sure, yeah. I mean, the first thing that I would say is when it comes to looking at other people, I would say always compare yourself to yourself rather than to someone who might be on a completely different path in their journey. So it's basically, I see a, a bunch of those questions similar to that in comments in my videos. And it always saddens me when I see someone who's down on their own skills because compared to myself, they don't have as much uh, as many skills. But that of course makes sense. If you just started and I've been programming for about 25 years now, obviously the skill gap is going to be different. So I would say pretty much just compare yourself with yourself. If you're doing better than you were doing a month ago, then I would say you're doing excellent. So yeah, for me, that that's pretty much it. I've just been writing code and making games for such a long time. So yeah, I mean, there's really no, no magic to it. It's really experience is the main thing. So the more games you make, the more code you write, everything becomes much, much easier. So yeah, it's really just the fact that I've been doing this for so long that yeah, I've managed to acquire a Decent skill set, I would say, yeah. How long have you been doing this exactly? Uh, I mean, I started using Unity in the end of 2012, so it has been now a bit over 10 years. And before that, I started programming when I was around 10 years old, started writing Holy random cow. IRC scripts. So yeah, <laughs> that was quite a long journey, yeah. That's incredible, yeah. And I can attest to what you're saying about um, you just, you keep on doing it and it gets a little bit easier as you're going. I've, I, you know, yeah. I'm more than a decade behind you in my journey, not not in Unity specifically, but in terms of programming. And yeah, it's one of those things where each year, um, if I compare it to my prior self from like last year, it's like, whoa, I've come really far, which is really cool. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Um, so your games, and you've published quite a few, they're published under Endless Loop Studios, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of blown away because before interviewing you, I was looking at, I looked you up on Steam, right? To see like how much stuff you had sure, published. Yeah. And uh, I saw, I counted 11 games on there. And I was like, holy crap, like that's absolutely <laughs> insane. And I know that you're working on another one right now. I've been watching your stuff on Dinky yep. Guardians. It looks like a lot of fun. Um, and I, I talked to a lot of game developers uh, on my Discord and just on various places online. And uh, a lot of us are just looking forward to publishing our very first game, right? Um, so back in kind of your earliest days, maybe on your first game or your second game, did you feel like you knew what you were doing back then? Uh, or were you kind of just figuring it out and just kind of struggling your way through it? Kind of like a lot of us are right now. Yeah, I was, I was definitely struggling and definitely, uh, it was not magic. It was not natural <laughs> at the beginning. However, at the same time, one thing to keep in mind is that, yep, I have been working with Unity since 2012, and that was around when I made my first Steam game. But actually, before that, I had spent about five years working with Flash, and I published about 40 uh, Flash games. So by the wow. time that I got to my first proper game, uh, my first Steam game, by then I already had quite a lot of experience with quite a lot of games. So yeah, once again, it comes back to experience. Yeah, if I think about the very first game that I made in Flash, which was all the way back in 2008, so that was ages ago. Yeah, for that one, just making something super basic <laughs> was extremely difficult. <laughs> and back then, YouTube pretty much didn't exist, wasn't a thing. So back then, trying to figure out how things work, uh, trying to figure out how action script worked, that was so strange. So yeah, I definitely struggled quite a lot through my through my own learning journey. But yeah, once again, it comes to 
experience. Nowadays, things that used to take me one week, one month to do, now I can do in one hour, something like that. So yeah, I definitely, I definitely have struggled just like everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really good for someone like me to hear, honestly. I'm, and I'm sorry, did you yeah. say 40, 4, 0 games in Flash? Yeah. Holy crap. I mean, keep in mind, keep in mind, Flash games are very small scale. Yes. They're essentially basically just game jam games. Still, so, still. Yeah, doing, doing that much really helps on gaining experience on, on everything. It's on programming, on game development, on game design, on learning how to make a complete product, a complete game, something that plays from start to finish, learning all of those skills, publishing 40 complete games that really helps uh, get in the flow of actually being able to finish things. Because that's another thing that a lot of people have trouble with is they start making games, but they never actually finish them. So right. the fact that I went through through that stage where I was pretty much just making tons of really tiny but complete games, that really helped me quite a lot. And that is definitely something that I would encourage a lot of people to do, yeah. Were you kind of just doing it for fun back then, the Flash games? Did you have like an end? Yeah, pretty much. Yep. I mean, uh, yes. And uh, basically back then, you know, around 2008, I wasn't really on a very uh, uh, good time in my life, let's say. I had just uh, uh, dropped out of college. Things weren't looking up to me, so I was quite a bit lost. But when I, when I, basically I found Flash and I found there was something called Mochi Ads, which is basically you could add ads to your Flash games that play pretty much like on YouTube, plays a little uh, pre-roll and you would get like a fraction of a cent out of it. So as soon as I saw that, at the time I was feeling pretty lost, I had no idea what I was going to do in my life, but then I, I saw this and I figured, okay, if I can make good games that get played by thousands or millions of people, then technically this could work, technically this could be a job. So that was kind of it. I started off pretty much just as a hobby, just living with my parents. So no goal, no nothing. But over time I realized, okay, so if I push in this direction, eventually with enough experience, I might be able to turn this into a career. So yeah, it was a, a bit hobby and a bit trying to make it work. Yeah. That's so cool. Cause like, yeah, to hear that you were going through a hard time back then like that. And now you've got this channel where you're approaching, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you're approaching half a million subscribers very quickly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're now helping a lot of people out there get started in their own game development journeys, uh, whether they're doing it for a hobby or whether they want to do it for a career. Um, you teach really good coding practices as well, which is one of those things that's really yeah. hard to find on YouTube in particular. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, that's something that uh, took me a while to value. So it is something that I really try to push in my videos because I know nowadays how, how valuable it is. But again, when I was just getting started, when I was just a beginner, learning how to structure a project correctly and learning how to write good clean code for me. I had no idea what any of that meant. I had no idea why that was important. Right. And yeah, so basically what I try to teach right now is basically to get people to learn a bit faster than I learned. So if I had learned the importance of these things, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had so much trouble on so many games just because the quality of the code, I didn't focus too much on that. Things would would have been much easier if I had access to my own tutorials back then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's very true. <laughs> Um, so just, uh, switching gears a little bit here, Blood, Sweat and Pixels is one of my favorite novels that I've ever, uh, read in regards to just various game development stories where, um, and they go through AAA studios as well as indie studios, like right down to Eric Barone making Stardew Valley just really walks you through the journey of making those games. And what I found really interesting is people that went through like really, really difficult times while making their games, whether it was... Um, you know, with AAA studios, they get, uh, there's so many people, there's so many moving pieces in this, in this cog, right? Yeah. And, but for an indie developer, you hear things like depression and burnout and things like that. Um, so in the process of publishing 11 games to Steam, um, have, do you have any like really, like really low points in your development or any horror stories where anything went horribly sure. wrong or anything like that? Sure, yeah. I mean, out of all of those games, I've had some that were much more successful than I thought and others that did much, much worse than I thought. So yeah, there were several times, several years where I thought, okay, can I really do this as a career or am I about to go bankrupt? There were uh, definitely a bunch of difficult times there. And the fact that I'm a solo indie dev also kind of makes it quite a bit hard because there's not much of a support group. Basically, it's all on me. If I don't make it work, then I don't get a paycheck. So yep. <laughs> yeah, that definitely adds quite a bit of stress. So yeah, it has definitely helped. I've definitely had quite a lot of uh, negative points, but at the same time also have positive points. So it just over time, it's a, it's a learning journey, really learning how to accept when things go wrong and importantly, analyzing why did they go wrong? Why did this game not sell as, as well as I was hoping? 
what could I have done differently and what can I learn so that the next one works well. So it's pretty much a learning journey. And it's also, of course, about uh, managing risk. One of the things that is a very uh, good benefit for my situation is just the fact that I, I live in Portugal, which is a pre and low cost of living country. So for me to consider a game success, I don't really need to sell 100,000 copies. Right. If it sells just a couple thousand, then it's already enough for me to pay my cost of living. So that meant that for even for the failures that I get, the ones that were successful were successful enough to give me a little bit of a buffer to essentially survive those failures. So yeah, that that really helps. Having that little buffer that <laughs> helps quite a lot in mental health in knowing, okay, so I'm not going to go homeless. <laughs> uh, the situation <laughs> isn't good. So yep. the project didn't go as well, but okay, I still got a bit of savings so I can still survive making one more game and so on. But yeah, I've definitely had my ups and downs, things that go well, things that don't go well. That's just... It's just part of the journey, yeah. That's an awesome mindset to have. Um, now, I know one of the age-old questions in terms of where to start with game development is what engine should you use? And I like I, I have my own opinions on that, but I'm just curious as to why did you choose the Unity game engine? And uh, have you ever considered using anything else? I mean, for me, the answer is super simple. It's basically in 2012 when I decided that I wanted to make the, the switch from Flash to making proper PC Steam games. Back then, the only option was Unity. Unreal was paid. I don't think Godot existed. Uh, I think Game Maker, I think I looked at it, but it looked a bit too limited. Right. So yeah, pretty much for me, I just chose Unity just by default. It was free. It was the only thing that I could do. So I started using it. I started learning it. And yeah, pretty much just kept on using it because so far, I have not yet come up with any game idea that I could not produce with Unity. So that's pretty much it for me. For me, when it comes to game engines, I know a lot of people like to get caught up in the game engine wars, which one is better, which one is worse. I mean, for me, engines are really just fuel. So yep. if you can build the game that you have with whatever engine, then go ahead and use it. Whatever it is, whether it's Unity and Real and Godot, doesn't really matter. It's just a it's just an engine, just a tool. So use whatever you want. And yeah, with regards to trying out other things, yeah, I, I would definitely would love to try out. <laughs> As with so many things, my biggest limitation is really just time. So yep. Yeah, I wish I could take like one month out of my life just to inspect Unreal and see what they do different, what they might do better than Unity and so on. But yeah, the time is pretty much the only limitation. Yeah. Yep, that makes sense. Um, so for someone who's launched 11 games, I'm just curious, um, and I actually don't know the answer to this. Do you, have you ever done a Kickstarter or have you ever worked with a publisher or have you ever launched a game uh, in early access, because I'm always curious. There's always there's all these options that people can take in terms of releasing their game, right? Sure. And I'm just kind of wondering, uh, did you ever do that? And did you, if you didn't, uh, what was your what was your kind of reasoning there? Early access, I did. There were several games that I went through in early access, and it actually did quite well. I mean, early access has changed quite a bit over the over the years, so. Nowadays, it's a bit more difficult, but back then it was a good thing because people were basically more forgiving and more willing to uh, basically help you develop the game. Whereas nowadays, even when a game is early access, players already expect it to be extremely polished, full right. of content and something. So in terms of expectation, things have definitely changed. So, so I did try early access in the past, but now in the future, I'm not sure if I would use it just because... By now, players expect out of an early access game pretty much the same as a full game, so that's a bit tricky. Uh, in terms of Kickstarter and publisher, no, not really, don't really have any experience with that. I mean, in terms of publisher, like I said, I got a pretty low cost of living, so I don't really need funding. So I pretty much just fund all my all my Steam games from my uh, from my savings. And yeah, Kickstarter also never the Kickstarter is one of those things that a lot of people think that it's kind of like free money <laughs> you just make the make the kickstarter make the thing and people send you money and then you can use it but that's really not the case making a kickstarter is a ton of work it yep. is a full-on marketing campaign so i would definitely just encourage people who are considering kickstarter to really look into it because it is definitely not easy there are plenty of games that don't find funding even if the funding goals are real low so just be aware of that just be aware that kickstarter is not free money. It requires a ton, ton of work. So if you go with those options, definitely look into that. All right. Um, now, we haven't talked about your YouTube channel too much, but I, I and I do want to point out again, you're approaching half a million subscribers, which is like crazy. Yeah, it's nice. Um, <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that a lot of people listening, and not everyone, but a lot of people listening are game developers who have probably at least toyed with the idea of starting their own YouTube channel, whether it's for devlogs or whatever, at some point. Um, and I'm just curious, 
from your perspective, uh, do you recommend it for most developers to start a YouTube channel? Why or why not? And for those who do decide to start a YouTube channel, uh, what advice would you give them? Uh, that's a bit of a tricky one. I mean, in general, <laughs> I would say yes, because it's very valuable. Yep. But at the same time, <laughs> kind of similar to Kickstarter, making a YouTube channel is not free. As I'm sure you've noticed, it takes a lot of time to make the videos, to edit them. It's to a handle time suck for sure. All the comments, uploading all the things. So it is a ton of work. So technically, in an infinite world, I would absolutely recommend it. But it really depends on what the goals are with the person, because it is almost like a second job. So if you just want to make games, adding a YouTube channel on top is quite a bit more work. So I would recommend it, but just be aware that it's going to take quite a lot of work. And in terms of getting started, I would say it really depends on, uh, first of all, try to identify what type of YouTube channel you want to be in. Like, mm -hmm. for example, for me, I started with tutorials. I don't really have, like, I don't have the personality to make like the wacky meme uh, devlog style things, kind of like Danny. Yep. Like that sound <laughs> can definitely work, but it definitely requires a very specific type of person, type of personality to record those types of videos, and yeah. I don't really have those. But I do believe I have quite a bit of knowledge, so that is why I went more for a tutorial-focused approach. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say if you really want to do it, definitely do it and try to figure out specifically what niche are you trying to solve. Are you doing just devlogs on your own specific game, because that can work, or are you trying to do more general things, just covering news, something like that, just covering tutorials? So there are plenty of approaches, and if you want to do it, Either way, I would definitely say start doing it because, uh, uh, or I would say try doing it because there's nothing to, there's nothing stopping you. So try it. And if you like it, then by all means, keep going. And if you do see that it's quite a lot of work and you would rather just work on the game, then perhaps consider just working on the game. But at the same time, uh, remember that nowadays, if you're going with the game, is to actually find success with the game. Marketing is an extremely important part of finding success nowadays. And YouTube is one of the best ways to do marketing. So... Uh, yeah, it's hard to say because it takes a lot of work, but it has a lot of pros and a lot of cons. Yeah. Yep, yep, and I I can vouch for that for sure. Do you uh do you edit all of your own videos? I'm super curious about that. Uh, earlier this year, I started experimenting with some editors. So until until this year, yeah, I was doing it. Now I'm editing, I don't know, like seventy percent of videos. So still the majority, but I've started experimenting with. Trying to get some people because yeah, uh, it takes a lot of time it's and editing so is one time. of the things that I, I absolutely hate. <laughs> <laughs> editing, I really hate it. Yeah, but I do like producing videos. I like publishing them. So yeah, I just got to go through it. Yeah, there's no choice. <laughs> That's so funny. I've never met another game developer yeah. that actually enjoys editing. It seems to be <laughs> something that universally yeah. every everyone that makes games seems to really hate editing. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where at first you definitely you have to do it yourself. And you can get to a position where you're you're lucky enough to be able to hire an editor if you so choose, right? Which is really, really cool. Um, now, um, you mentioned, obviously, marketing is super, super important. Now, for those people who are listening that want to make games, but they have no ambition or no like plans whatsoever to start a YouTube channel to promote their game for those people who, who are not going to do a YouTube channel, what would you what advice would you give them in terms of uh, finding success with their games and marketing their games? Uh, well, without YouTube definitely <laughs> makes things quite a bit harder, especially if, especially if you mean, I don't want to do YouTube. I don't want to do any social media. Cause for example, TikTok lately is something that apparently has been blowing up. It is something that I would like to experiment with because mm -hmm. some devs have found quite a lot of success. So that is something to try. But if you also don't want to do that, then yeah, that really severely limits things. I mean, when, uh, two resources that I can point people to is the Game Discover Co. newsletter and uh, Chris Zukowski. Those are the two main sources from which I've learned a ton about indie game marketing. So I'll definitely say research that because marketing is another one of those things that it, it's an entire world, it's an entire skill set that you absolutely need to learn. And that's actually something that I focus on until, I don't know, about four years ago. The So yeah, for quite a lot of time, I didn't really focus on it until Steam became harder and harder to the point where right now it is absolutely essential. So yeah, in terms of actual tips, I mean, I can say what I was doing before uh, I had YouTube, which was pretty much just the old school method of I launch a game and on every single one of my games, I had a little widget where you could input your email account and basically that would go into a mailing list. So every time that I put every game, I put that little widget. So for the next game, I can send the email to the people who played the previous game and maybe they won't wishlist it, buy it, and so on. So 
Yeah, I mean, you can do it, but it's definitely much more difficult because if you don't want to do any kind of social media, then I think the best option is really just make a ton of games and try to get the people who play those games to play your next one. That would be my strategy. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, and game dev is one of those things that's really hard to get into, right? And I even just in terms of learning how to do it, and I know because I avoided it for like a, a really long time because I was intimidated by the prospect of learning how to program stuff. Um, and learning how to use the engine and just all of that. There's so much, right, in terms of the learning. Um, for someone on, like, day one of their game dev journey, like, they just decide today that they want to start learning how to make games, uh, where would you tell them to start? And keep in mind, people have asked me this question, and I actually, uh, you're, you've got a 10-hour free course on your YouTube channel. I have pointed people yeah. to that exact video before, so if that's your answer, that's totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would be one of my answers. I mean, the response to that video has been great. So people have really enjoyed it. So yeah, I would say that's a good example. But beyond that, really just start super small because that's that's one of the big problems that everyone falls into, myself included, which is wanting to make something super, uh, super complex, which it happened to me as well. I mean, when I started making Flash games, so my first two, three games were really tiny, really small, something that I made in a week. And then for some reason, on like my fourth or fifth game, I decide, okay, why don't I do an entire MMO, multiple <laughs> games, cops and robbers, tons of players, tons of things. That's awesome. And obviously that that game never never came to life. <laughs> I worked on it for quite a while before realizing I didn't have the skills to to do something on that scope. So, so yeah, for the people listening, if you fall into that trap, don't worry, that's perfectly normal. Everyone falls into. So just try to keep the scope small. Start off by doing things like insanely simple, like things on the scale of Flappy Bird. That is something that you just press a button, just goes up, down, it's got some basic collisions. So that's the kind of scale that you should be aiming for for your first game. But I would say even before that, just learning programming in general. I mean, you always start with Hello World. So really just make a console app, just make it log something and just start from there. So basically just start simple rather than trying to think already of the games that you're playing and trying to recreate that because people... They play games like Call of Duty and they think, okay, so I want to build something like that. Obviously, that is on a completely different scale. So yep. you really got to start super small, think something really limited. Gotcha. Yeah, start small and start simple, right? Um, you've been doing this for decades now. Like, like you're in terms of where you're at in your skill set and all that stuff, you've been doing this a long time. You're you're at this level that I'm, I can't wait to get to the level that you're at in terms of my programming yeah. knowledge and all that stuff. So from your perspective, I'm always curious, like, because when I'm working away on my stuff, I still learn new stuff, like almost on a daily basis where I run into a roadblock and I'm like, I don't know how to, how to do this. And I, you know, you go into Google or chat GPT or, or whatever, Reddit, you'd start doing your research, you dink around with some stuff and you figure it out. Right. And I'm just, from someone like you who's been doing this for so, so long, do you still, does that still happen to you? Does the learning ever stop? Do you ever run into situations where like, you're like, I don't know how to make this. <laughs> I have this idea in my head, but I'm not sure how to approach it. Does that still happen to you or not so much anymore? Sort of. It's more of a, a different thing. So it is the, uh, the biggest skill set is really learning how to break things into chunks. That was one of the Biggest things that I had a lot of trouble with when I was a beginner is I think about making a huge system and I'm trying to make, okay, how do I build this entire system? Whereas nowadays I know, okay, if I got a huge system, I can actually split it into tiny components and I can build one component at a time to get these systems. So that is one of the main things. Whereas when I was a beginner, I would have no idea where to start. Whereas now I can already break it into pieces and I can see it. But at the same time, yeah, it's always a constant learning journey that never stops. That part never goes away. I'm constantly trying to improve, trying to learn new things. So... Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of both. I mean, uh, there are things nowadays that I can do in about one hour that previously would have taken me months. So that's just really, like, for example, just learning how to solve a simple null reference exception, which everybody sees all the time. Yep. As a beginner, it would probably take me like one hour to figure out, okay, I got an error. Why, why is it giving me an error? Why, what is the problem? Whereas nowadays I get the error. I don't even get frustrated. I just go back into Visual Studio and most times I can just see, okay, obviously I just forgot to drag this reference, go right. back and it's fixed. So yeah, it's really more about the more code you write, the better you become at debugging, at figuring out when things go wrong so that by the time that I see an error nowadays, it's it's pretty rare that it's an error that I've never seen before. Usually most of the time it's something that, oh, okay, I remember that I got this error similar, so I know a similar way to uh, try to solve it. Or even if I don't, then I, I'm much better at figuring out, okay, 
what questions do I need to ask? What logs do I need to add in order to figure out why this error is happening? What is it, why is it happening at this point, not at this point, and so on? So, so yeah, it's a mix of both. Experience helps quite a lot. I'm much more productive, but at the same time, constant learning. I'm constantly trying to research new things with C Sharp, with Unity, trying out new packages, constantly learning tons of new things. So yeah. That's awesome. And what you said uh, really resonates with me in terms of, I, I think being a being a productive person, one of the best things that you just said is you don't get frustrated when you see an error. You're just like, oh, it just, I'm, exactly. it's a, pro it's a little problem. I'm just gonna go figure it out. Instead, you can waste all this time getting pissed off about it. And I notice, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> I notice that when I'm frustrated, that's when I'm at my least productive because I, it's like I can't Definitely. think properly when I'm frustrated. So, yeah, that's uh, that that was really key for me. And um, if you're not comfortable with this question, I can cut this out. That's totally cool. But um, from someone who has almost launched a dozen games now you're working on dinky guardians and i think that'll make it an even dozen for you um but what type of wish list numbers do you kind of hope for these days um what are you hoping for uh, with dinky guardians well the general consensus is you should have around ten thousand. Yep. so that is the number at which point uh steam basically considers your game okay this is a real game it's not an asset flip or something so <laughs> let's give it a bit more visibility <laughs> yeah that is generally ten thousand. that is the number you should try to get uh although at this point thinky gardens is currently with about 1300 and the release date is supposed to be in about a uh, month and a half two months so i'm hoping that by the time that i release i'm still going to participate in the steam festival i'm hoping by the time the release to have at least around five thousand. like I think if I can get to 5,000, then it may uh, do well enough for me to consider it a success. But yeah, uh, on that on that note, one thing that really matters is defining what does success actually mean to you? Like, what is your definition of success? Do you need to sell 100,000 copies or just 10,000? Right. Or is just launching the game, is that successful enough? So that is, for me, in this case, my last game was in 2019. So it has been quite a while. So for me right now, my definition of a success, just launching this game, I'm going to consider that a success. Yep. It's been such a long time, so I really want to publish a game. So, so for me, just launching it, it won't be a success. And if it sells well, even great, even, even better. That's a nice bonus. So, yep. yeah. But uh, in terms of raw numbers in general, nowadays, if you want to find good financial success, the general consensus is you should have around ten thousand wish lists by the time you launch. Okay. Which is quite difficult, but uh, yeah, that's a number. <laughs> All right. Um, to give people a little bit of context, because uh, you said you're hoping to launch. Did you say in a month and a half? Yeah, pretty much. End pretty of much. July, August, okay. something like that. So around there. And how long uh, have you been working on the game so far, just to give people context behind the game? Uh, well, that's a bit tricky. Well, uh, I started working in uh, early March, I think. But at the same time, I'm trying to work on the game and keep the YouTube channel running. Yes. So keep making videos, keep answering comments, questions, courses, all those kinds of things. So yeah, I started working in March, but it hasn't been full time. I wish it was. <laughs> that would have been quite a bit more productive. But <laughs> yeah, so I don't know, maybe one month full time, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and it, yeah, I can, being a YouTuber and a game developer at the same time, you can't be a full time game developer. Like you, <laughs> you wouldn't yeah, be able to sleep. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to sleep. It's, it it's <laughs> absolutely crazy. And so on that note, you just mentioned, so yeah, you've got courses. I checked before our interview here, you've published... Uh, at least as of uh, when I came up with these questions, you've published 747 videos on YouTube in the last five or six years. Um, <laughs> it's funny. Quite you're a like, lot. You're yeah. like, holy crap, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's <a> and, lot. <laughs> uh, and, you, and you're working on a game that's shaping up to look like really, really good. Like I've been watching your development process. It looks like a lot of fun, like I said. Yeah, and, I'm really um, enjoying working on it. And the response has been very nice. And thanks to all the, all the comments, I get lots of ideas and lots of brainstorming. So... <laughs> Right now, the ideas that I have in my head, if I can execute, I think the final game will be really nice. So I'm really looking forward to working on it more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, you also, I know, and you've said this in a lot of your videos, you try very hard to answer every single one of your comments. And when you're a tutorial guy, there's a lot of questions. Some of them require a little bit of digging, a little bit of research. So like yeah. the amount of time that you spend on all of this stuff that you do, I'm just curious, like what keeps you motivated to be working so hard? Because like that's that's a lot of stuff courses and youtube and answering all the stuff and working on a game it's a lot what keeps you motivated and if you have days where you're ever feeling just like down or low energy or unmotivated like is there anything that you do to kind of just pick yourself up and kick yourself in the ass to get moving kind of thing <laughs> uh 
I don't know if I have much insight into this. I mean, I would say in terms of work-life balance, that is the one thing that I am not a good example of. <laughs> I would definitely not encourage anyone to work as much as I do. So that is not quite a positive, but I mean, the positive is really just that I, I love what I do. I love making games. I love researching things. I love teaching the things that I learn to other people. So I love what I do. I constantly, there's always something that I want to do. So in terms of, uh, trying to figure out what to work on next. That is, <laughs> thankfully, that is not a problem that I have. I've got a list with like hundreds of ideas that I would love to do. And that is pretty much what keeps me going forward. I know, okay, if I want to do this next idea, I got to finish this one first. So I, I'm really motivated to finish this idea so that I can finish this one, then go on to the next one, next one, next one, and so on. Uh, so yeah, pretty much just got lots of stuff that I want to do. I enjoy what I do, so I keep working. But yeah, of course, there are, there are always downtimes, negative moments, there are always things that really just suck. And well, the main thing that I've learned through the years is there really are times when there's no there's no magic to it. When something is bad, you really just got to push through it. Just there's no magic button. There's no magic fix. There are some times that it really is difficult. Like, for example, for me, one of the things that I absolutely hate <laughs> is to do with sound effects and music. For some reason, <laughs> I really hate that. I, <laughs> I really suck at picking music, picking sound effects. But of course, every single game needs to have those things. Yeah. So every time that I make a game... I already know, okay, I'm going to hate this part, but if I want to finish the game, I got to push through it. So, yep. so yeah, that keeps me motivated knowing, okay, I really want to push the game. I really want to publish it. And if I want to publish it, I got to go through this part that I don't like. So there's really no way around it. So I really got to push through it. So yeah, that's, uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is simply just doing a lot of things. Like what you mentioned, I do a lot of things. That is both a negative, but also, also a positive because... Uh, it's a negative because I do way too much. <laughs> so yeah, that's not very good. But it's a positive because it's a lot of variety. So like every single day, I'm not working on, I'm not just writing code 10 hours a day straight. That's not what I do. I, I write a bit of code, then I do a bit of game design, then I do a bit of, uh, I don't know, a bit of recording, a bit of writing for the videos, a bit of researching some other topic. Uh, then of course, doing things outside of work like uh, one thing that I never uh, never sacrifice is my time going to the gym. So I go to the gym every day, and that to me is something that really helps. Is one of the main things that I I think has helped me from ever feeling any kind of burnout, something like that. Is because that is one thing that I never skip. I also never skip my sleep. So even when I'm at the very edges of, of a project, I always make sure to always sleep correctly. And of course, I got my two dogs, and uh, it doesn't matter what is going on with me. They need to go outside. So yeah, what whatever is going on with the project, I always have to take the breaks to take them outside. So yeah, having a lot of things to do is both a negative, but also positive because a lot of variety, a lot of things. So it's not always doing the same thing. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I I wanted to ask you so bad. I was like, I knew this. I know this guy works out. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're, you don't, considering how much stuff you actually have to do and considering like how busy you are, you don't look like someone who's like really, really like downtrodden or like, <laughs> or like you're suffering yeah. from any kind of like, you look like a guy that enjoys what he does. Um, and you know, yeah, you, you're very healthy looking. Uh, if that's not weird for me to say, <laughs> but like you see some programmers. No, it that is. Are just... I mean, uh, yeah, exactly. And that is something that I, uh, although I have to say I wasn't like this all the time. So just to, just in case people are on different parts of their journey, I mean, uh, 10 years ago, I was quite a lot overweight. I had no energy. I couldn't do anything. Yeah. Working out is one of those things that it, it sounds counterintuitive. It sounds like you work out. Okay. I'm going to spend a bunch of energy so then I'm going to come back home and I'm going to be completely dead, but that's really not the case because the human body adapts. And the more you work out, the more energy you start to get because your body becomes used to things. I mean, one of the things that I started doing just recently, these past few months, is starting to run quite a bit more. I'm actually trying to finish a marathon in a few months, so that should be fun. That nice. should be interesting. That's a fun challenge. Uh, and yeah, one thing that I've noticed is just just six months ago, going on a 5K run, I'd come back and yeah, and I would be completely dead. Whereas nowadays, just this, just this weekend, I went out, I ran 15 kilometers, came back home, and I was perfectly fine. I was working the whole afternoon Holy and crap. everything was fine. So yeah. So for people listening, if you want to be productive, I would definitely encourage you to stay active, do whatever you want, gym, working out, yoga, Pilates, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Anything that keeps you active in the end gives you energy. So yeah, that is something that I'm very passionate about. So <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, you, you already answered this a little bit, but uh, in terms of, I guess I'm just curious, have you ever suffered from burnout of any kind? Or it, now you mentioned that you it's don't... It's kind of hard because... Yeah. because 
I don't know, because definition of burnout is a bit tricky. There have definitely been times, uh, like every time I release a game, the last two weeks, those are always, it doesn't matter how much I try to plan, the last two weeks are always going to be like 14-hour days, not healthy at all, not right. good. So the end is always, is always very difficult, and that is always something that I've tried to combat. And I would say in the past uh, two games, I think I think the releases were much more calm than some games before that, so that's something that you'll learn. But yeah, uh, I know for a fact that if I do that, if I spend two weeks working 14 hours, then yeah, at that point, I do feel burnout. And I remember there were like, I don't know, about a month after releasing some of my games that I just, I, I couldn't walk, I couldn't do anything. So yeah, so so yeah, pretty much uh, the things that I mentioned, being able, trying to have a good routine, do things, trying to stay healthy, never push it way too far. and. That has been the best way that I've managed to avoid burnout, pretty much. Just don't go to the red line constantly and just give your time to recover, pretty much. That's the best advice that I can say, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, man, like I, I wanna thank you so much again for coming on. And I just wanna say um, to everyone who's listening, go and wishlist Dinky Guardians. I, I've watched all the devlogs on this game. It looks like a ton of fun and um, Go and check out Code Monkey's YouTube channel. Like, if you want to learn game development, this is the man's channel that you want to go to if you are interested in learning Unity. Um, this guy's absolutely killing it, and <laughs> you definitely want to take advice from this guy because he knows what he's doing. Um, and with that said, is is there any like parting words that you want to say before we shut this down? Oh, yeah, thanks so much for uh, having me. This was interesting, and for anyone watching, just keep on trying your. Keep on going on your learning journey. It takes time, but just keep going one day at a time. And over time, you'll gain experience and things become much easier and much better. So keep at it. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Take care. All right. Enjoy the rest of your week. Bye. All right. I want to give a very special thank you to all of our Hall of Fame patrons, Jakob Yondok, Zondra Kessler, Darren Preen, Throbbing Wind, Fontaine Waite, Couch, Christopher Nichols, and Brainwaves to Binary, as well as our Early Access patrons, Zyoma, Ken Waite, Mason Crow, Mr. D, Audio Games, Yon, Donnie Briggs, Alexander Prestis, Darren Cook, Godsworn, Abdulaziz, Hamad, Alanazi, Bill Guo, Alone on Mars, Code Jutsu, Merler, Ayush Sharma, and Jarrett Whitehead. If you choose to support us on Patreon, you can get access to all of our YouTube videos, monthly alpha builds, and more.